Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. My name is Hattie, I'm a scout for Dauber Prospects and I'll be breaking down my top 15 prospects for the 2024 NHL Draft. This is part 2 of a 2 part series where I break down my mid-season rankings uh, and we'll be counting up from 15 to 1 in this part here. I'll be breaking down uh, the, the players games with analysis and tape and kind of showing you what kind of player your team would be getting by selecting these players. Uh, if you like the content make sure to like and subscribe it takes a moment of your time and it helps out the channel out a lot and leave me a comment down below letting me know what you think of the episode what you think of my rankings whether you agree or disagree as long as you keep it civil and polite uh i'll be down there replying to comments answering any questions that you guys have feel more than free to let me know down below um so let's get right into it with pick number 15 in my ranking it's going to be igor chernishov of dynamo moscow in the khl and mhl the mhl is basically the junior equivalent to the russian pro leagues uh and he's split the season pretty much evenly between the two leagues and he's really great in both leagues in kind of different ways in the mhl the combination of size speed and skill is very obvious and it's overwhelming he is dominant at that level he's got soft hands for his size he often catches defensemen off guard with quick moves off the wall and on top of that he's a great defensive player uh, which kind of surprised me when I first started watching him. The positioning, the effort, uh, the motor, the drive defensively is a big plus in this game. And in the KHL, he really leans into those defensive responsibilities. Uh, I think it's a confidence thing, you know, kind of learning to trust his puck skills and his pure skill in the KHL is still something he needs to learn. Um, but overall, he's got a safe floor and he's got top six upside in my opinion, but more likely as a kind of second line complementary piece. But there's still room to grow in terms Chernyshov's game, which makes him a really interesting prospect, and that's why I have him at 15 in my rankings. Moving on to 14, we have Tej Aginla of the Kelowna Rockets. He's Jerome Aginla's son. Uh, and he's eligible for this draft, which makes me feel a bit old. But uh, he basically went from a bottom six checking role in Seattle um, in the WHL. Seattle was, you know, all in for the playoffs last season. And um, he was playing in kind of a bottom six role on that team as kind of a checking forward. But now he's been traded to Kelowna Rockets and he's been playing basically first line minutes the entire year. And his adaptation and his chemistry with Andrew Crystal and Kelowna has been great to watch. He's a highly intelligent player. He's always leading the play, always dictating what his opponents and his teammates are doing on the ice. He's also hard on the forecheck. He's got great soft skill to get off the boards as well. Um, but, you know, what really stands out in his puck skills is his goal-scoring ability, especially in tight. It's a great aspect of his game. But he still has those soft hands, that great vision in order to make plays. The issue with Aginla and why he's not higher in my rankings is that I see the defensive game as a big setback in his game. Especially, you know, heading back on the back check. He can overskate his lanes. He can, you know, miss assignments, that kind of stuff. Um, so he's still figuring out the defensive side of things, but I think he has the upside to be a top six goal scoring winger, kind of a 30 goal scorer, uh, and a potential com complimentary piece on the top line, not necessarily the play driver, but a player who can make life really easy for his teammates on the top line potentially. Moving on to 13th overall, we have Anton Salaev of Torpedo in the KHL. Now, this might be very, very low for some. I've seen him as high as second overall on some rankings, but I have my concerns and I'll explain them in this segment. Uh, so let's get the obvious out of the way. He's six foot seven. He is a massive, massive defenseman. Uh, and he's been playing in the KHL all season in a top four role, which isn't easy for a draft eligible. Um, his size and skating combination is unlike anyone I've ever scouted. His body proportion is pretty much ideal to allow all that weight and lankiness to transfer properly. The, the stride mechanics are great as well. He's got great ankle flexion, knee bend, uh, he pushes through the hips, all that good stuff, and that helps him close gaps ridiculously well. I mean, I've seen him catch forwards on a breakaway with five or six strides to make up for it. But here are my concerns with Salayev. First and foremost, he panics a lot when he's pressured. He can throw pucks up the ice and, you know, try to get rid of the puck. You know, he, he often passes or shoots the puck just to get rid of it. So that leads to a lot of turnovers. It leads to avoidable dump outs. And that's what kind of limits his game. But also his positioning off the puck is inconsistent at best. He can also get way too aggressive off the rush. He leaves gaps in defensive formation. So all in all... For me, he's almost definitely going to be a top four defenseman in the NHL, but I see him more as kind of a number three, number four, whose warts you just have to live with because he's so big and mobile. Moving on to number 12, we have Michael Bronsegg Newgard, a winger of Moro IK in the Alsvenskan, uh, which is Sweden's second division of pro hockey. And he's, he probably has the best defensive game of any forward in this draft class. His intelligence, his motor, his positioning, and his instincts all shine the brightest defensively. And initially, with him struggling to score in Alsvenskan, 
it seemed like a lot of folks just accepted that he doesn't have any offensive upside, but he can shoot the puck. Like, he's a really good goal scorer, especially off the wrister, especially in stride. But I also really like his small area playmaking. He's kind of elevated by those smarts. Uh, and he has decent but not overwhelming hands. What really makes his offensive game tick, though, is the offensive habits. He always gets off the wall, he always draws players to him, and he does lots of small things that open up lanes for his teammates when he's moving off the puck. I think there's 20 to 30 goal upside with uh, Michael Brenzik Newgard. He just screams middle six winger to me, and any team looking to contend would be elated to have a player like him on their roster, especially in penalty kill situations and in defensive zone faceoff situations. And now we get to number 11, and I think this one's going to shock a couple, but it's Cole Eiserman, the winger of the U.S. National Team Development Program. Uh, and if you think I've lost my mind, I promise I haven't. I have tried all season to like Eiserman as much as others do, and I've watched the NTDP probably more than any other team this year. But he's just way too frustrating every time I watch him. Let's get the good out of the way. I mean, he's the best goal scorer in this class by a decent margin. His shot is ridiculous. He's got a heavy and quick release, and he hits those corners every time. Goal scoring is just second nature to him. The off-puck movement in the offensive zone to find space is also really, really good. But the list of bad things in his game is long and extensive. His decision-making is frankly awful. He rarely passes, and when he does, it's the wrong pass. He forces pucks into crowds of opponents instead of delaying and kind of looking for options. His physical game and his skating aren't really improving because he keeps trying to take shortcuts that prevent him from stress testing these elements in game. And he's one of the worst defensive players I've ever scouted. Drafting him is a pure bet on upside, but there's so much precedent with this type of player failing. I'm thinking of the likes of Arthur Kaliev and Oliver Wallstrom, both former NTDP boys who really relied on movement and their shot to score, but couldn't translate their game effectively, at least not yet. At best, you're getting a 50-goal scorer out of Eiserman, and at worst, you're getting a slower, less powerful Josh Anderson. I don't think there's much of a chance that he slips out of the, you know, top seven, uh, but for me, realistically, the players I have ahead of him are more translatable and don't make me want to pull my hair out when I'm watching them. Which brings us to number 10, and it's going to be Liam Greentree of the Windsor Spitfires in the OHL. He is the captain of that team, by the way, as a draft-eligible prospect, so... Already, the leadership abilities are a big plus, and when I first watched him early this season, I kind of saw a goal-scoring winger whose smarts were good, but not anything great. Uh, but as the season went on, Greentree got more and more comfortable dishing the puck, and it became so clear that he's not just an above-average intelligence player, he's actually insanely smart. He's always drawing someone in, he's always driving the middle with the puck, uh, and he constantly makes plays in motion and plays a lot of give-and-goes. And give-and-goes and give are something that you don't always see in junior, but when you see them, it's a great indicator of a player who can scale up his game to the NHL level. It's a player who anticipates to play a step or two in advance, which is a great start and a great step up over some other prospects. His vision and his passing accuracy are really good too, and he's got sneaky hands for his size, but what really makes his offensive game tick is, again, the wrister. It's heavy, it's accurate, he's able to release it in motion. For me, the only concern with Liam Greentree is the skating. His mechanics are lacking, but I think the right development team can turn that around and make Greentree a dominant winger. Uh, he's got top six upside in my opinion, but that rests really on his ability to get quicker and more agile. But overall, you're getting a player who's going to impact your game in all three zones and give you some great results. At ninth overall, we have Consta Hellenius, a center of Eucharist in Liga. He's been playing full-time in Liga, mostly in the top six uh, this season, and for me, he's one of the smartest players in the draft, if not the smartest. His positioning, his anticipation, and his awareness of both his teammates and his opponents on the ice is a massive plus in his game. Uh, and that's really good because his tools are all good or great, but not elite. Um, his passing is great, I think. It's the top of the of the trifecta of puck skills. He's got great vision, great instincts when dishing the puck. Uh, his shot is just slightly above average. It's not as powerful or accurate as other top prospects. Um, and his hands are good. You know, he catches pucks well. He settles them in his hip pocket right away to prepare his next play. And he can get off the boards and spin off pressure fairly well. But for me, what really makes his game tick is the smarts and especially the polished and mature defense of game. The habits are great on the defensive side of things. He anticipates rotations and routes really well. He's got an active stick. He keeps his head on a swivel. I have a hard time seeing him become anything less than a second line center at the NHL level, but I have just as hard a time seeing him become anything more. So, you know, it just it's just about how much you value a second line center of this quality. Um, but I think he can make it in the NHL and be a really effective two-way player. 
At 8th overall, we have Sam Dickinson. And in my opinion, Sam Dickinson is the best pure defensive player in the draft. He's incredibly mobile, not just for his size, but just overall. He's mean, he's physical off the rush and in his own zone, and he's really smart with his defensive zone interventions. You know, when his opponents are cycling the puck, he doesn't rush his interventions. He closes gaps for the right timing uh, in order to kind of break off the puck and, and uh, make a play out of his zone. With the puck... I mean, he's trying things, and he's really daring with the puck, but he puts himself in trouble sometimes, and his decision-making isn't always consistent on the puck. I think there's a clear path to a top four on defense for Sam Dickinson, and he's got a little room to add some more. He reminds me a bit of kind of a jacked-up Caden Gooley, uh, a player who's going to be able to play in your top four, defend the rush really well, uh, but he's got a bit more physical snarl and meanness to him than Caden Gooley at the NHL level. At 7th overall, we have Artyom Levshinov of Michigan State in the NCAA, uh, and I had a lot of trouble with Levshinov at the start of the year. He was making a lot of mistakes, he was causing a lot of odd man rushes against, uh, but that's mainly because he was playing in Belarus's U18 league just two years ago, and all due respect to Belarus, that's not a level of hockey that necessarily makes you think. But as the season's gone on in Michigan State, he's gotten calmer and more efficient, uh, especially on the breakout heading out of his zone. Uh, his mobility is a massive plus he's one of the most mobile defensemen in this draft and he's a great breakout passer too he's really toolsy which really makes him stand out he's an athlete he's he's really mobile like i mentioned the shot is powerful he's got soft hands too uh and he covers so much ice defensively he can play physical but he also often leads with a stick so for me he's almost definitely going to be a top four defenseman he's got a bit more upside than sam dickinson and also less certainty to his profile at 6 overall, we have Zeev Buyam of the University of Denver in the NCAA, and his progression over the past year has been insane. I mean, he forced his way into the top 4 for Denver. Uh, he forced his way onto the World Juniors roster as Team USA's only draft eligible on the team. That includes the likes of Cole Eijeman, who wasn't on that roster. Uh, and he's basically forced his way into my top six as well. He's so shifty and elusive. He's really hard to contain when he has the puck. He's surprisingly solid defensively too, especially off the rush. He constantly forces opponents to dump the puck. His ability to close gaps with the right timing and without taking himself out of place is great. He's got a great shot, but he mainly uses his wrister, kind of like Lane Hudson, um, but really his passing is the main offensive tool for me. He sees the ice really well, and he knows when to try a risky pass and when to just keep it simple. I think he's got true top fair upside. He could score 60 points in the NHL if everything goes well, but at worst you get a bottom pair defenseman who does a bit of everything right, um, and that kind of that gap in projections between his floor and his upside is what keeps him out of the top five for me, but it's also what gives him the edge over the likes of Dickinson and Aleshinov. And now we get into the top five, and we're going to start off with Berkeley Catton. He is so dynamic. Even if the speed is about average, it's just really about the agility and his ability to escape pressure um, and to kind of get around opponents in transition. He's so creative and so daring with the puck. He's always attacking opponents' heels and sending them the wrong way in transition. The offensive instincts are also off the charts. He just seems to have the sixth sense for where the puck is going to go, and he can see the open ice before it opens up. I love his in-stride snapshot as well. He doesn't need to slow down or settle the puck to shoot it hard and accurately in motion. And he's an amazing passer too. Uh, I think the defensive game is definitely not a plus, but he compensates for it with really good offensive tools, and most of the time, he's positioning himself proactively and helping his team transition the puck well after defensive sequences. For me, the upside with Catton is you get an 85-point winger, kind of a top power play guy, but try to keep him away from his own zone. You're going to get better results. At fourth overall, we have Caden Lindstrom, and I've been alternating all year between Catton and Lindstrom at fourth overall, and, you know, they're really different players, but both equally impactful. What makes Lindstrom a top five prospect, in my opinion, is the combination of size, strength, meanness, and skill. Offensively, he's got a heavy shot, he's got really good hands. I especially like the ability to catch a bad pass that he has. It's probably the best in this draft. You never, you don't need to, to put the puck exactly in his wheelhouse. You can just throw it his way and he'll find a way to corral it and make a play. Uh, he's got great vision. He's got really good smarts with the puck as well. And I really like the engagement and motor defensively. It really helps his game and... That's why I see him more as a true center, whereas Berkeley Catton is probably more of a winger. 
Lindstrom's also constantly trying to get under his opponent's skin, which is so weird because off the ice, everything I've heard about him has been overwhelmingly positive. By all accounts, he's a great person, but once you get him on the ice, he's a pain to play against. I think he's raw in terms of habits and decision making, but he has tremendous upside and usually players like this who are so smart with the puck and get so many puck touches in a game they inevitably end up figuring out the habits and decision-making aspects. So for me, the upside with, with Lindstrom is you got a top six do-it-all center who can take face-offs in all three zones, who can play defensively really well, um, and who can make plays in transition that'll really surprise you with his, with his size and skill. And now we get to third overall, and this might be a bit contentious, but my third overall pick is Zane Parekh, a defenseman out of the Saginaw Spirit in the OHL. His skill is ridiculous. He's got the best shot of any defenseman in this draft. He's got really quick hands. He's got a smooth and fluid skating stride, and his passing ability is off the charts. But on top of all that, for me, what really makes him stand out is that he's the most poised defenseman in this draft. You cannot shake him pressure-wise. It is ridiculous. Sometimes he's even too poised. I think he still needs to learn when the best play is just to yeet the puck up the ice defensively because he's being pressured from three directions and just throw the puck out, man. That kind of thing. But the defensive concerns, in my opinion, have been overblown. He defends the rush really well. He's really good on retrievals and he boxes out the net front aggressively, which is more or less what you would like to see from an offensive defenseman. But there's just way too much skill and vision and composure with Perek. I have a hard time seeing him become anything less than a number three offensive defenseman. And his upside is astronomical. There is a world, in my opinion, where Zane Perek becomes a point per game defenseman in the end. NHL. A lot needs to go right, but I think the upside is there, which it isn't with any other prospects. So for me, it's just the talent is overwhelming with Perak. The composure is ridiculous. The skating is great. There's just so much to love, and it'll take a lot for him to be dethroned from third overall. I really like his game, and I think it's going to translate really well. And now at second overall, we have Ivan Demidov, the right winger out of SKA St. Petersburg in the MHL. He is a hyper-skilled winger. By far and away, he has the best hands in this draft, and arguably the best hands I've seen since at least Jack Hughes. It is absurd how he's able to wriggle out of problems with the most creative stuff you'll ever see. On top of that, his shot is decent. I mean, he's got a great back leg wrister and a great one-timer, and it helps him score some goals at the MHL level. Uh, his playmaking is ridiculous as well. He's got amazing vision. He already shows lots of versatility and adaptability in how he connects with his teammates, especially in the offensive zone. And he has a surprisingly great foundation of defensive tools, especially by MHL standards. He puts in second and third efforts on the back check, he identifies his checks in his own zone, he defends the rush fairly well. Uh, so for me, there's a foundation of defensive tools there that's really able to uplift his offensive game and get him more puck touches, which you can't say, if, you know, if you look back at last year with Matvey Michkov, that was a main issue, and it's still an issue this year. He's not creating his own puck touches, he's letting his teammates do that for him, but Demidov is creating his own. The upside for me with Demidov is a 90-point pure skill winger, but he needs to get out of the MHL ASAP. He is way too good for this level of competition. And to close things off, we go to the first overall pick in my rankings, and there are no surprises here. It is Macklin Celebrini of Boston University in the NCAA. I have a whole video on my channel about what makes Celebrini the best prospect in this draft. If you want to go check it out, it breaks it down more in detail, but... To break it down simply, his ability to create chances off the rush is the most polished for a draft eligible that I've ever scouted. He's constantly attacking downhill and forcing opponents on their heels. He's constantly putting opponents on the back burner, trying to keep up with him. What really makes him especially interesting for me is that he took what made him so lethal off the rush and applied it to his offensive zone cycle game as well. He's got great offensive tools too. I mean, his one-timer from the half wall is a weapon, but he also has many different shots in his arsenal. His vision, his motor, his engagement, his habits, his awareness, all of that are huge pluses in his game. And he's gotten better defensively as the season's gone on as well. At 17, he was the best player on Team Canada at the World Juniors, and he's been BU's best player this year. He leads the NCAA in points per game as of recording this too. So for me, the upside with Celebrini is a true number one center on a contender, but not on the level of kind of McDavid or Bedard. Just think of kind of a combo of Jonathan Taves and Nathan McKinnon, uh, and somewhere in between those two in terms of overall upside career-wise. 
But that wraps things up for my breakdown of my top 15 for the 2024 NHL Draft and my mid-season rankings. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you like the video, please take a moment of your time to like the video and subscribe to the channel. Uh, leave me a comment down below letting me know what you think of the episode, what you think of my rankings. And again, if you agree, if you disagree, I'd like to hear it. As long as you keep it polite and civil, I'll be down there replying to your comments, letting you know what I think and also answering any questions you might have. I'm also on Twitter at HattieK underscore Scouting. I'm a lot more active on Twitter and I actually have my top 75 prospects and 15 honorable mentions posted right now as my pinned tweet if you want to go and check it out. Uh, but this has been Hattie from Dauber Prospects and thank you for watching this. I hope you tune in for my next episode.